inside out or outside in, dragging or popping the racket. When you talk about absorbing pace, the strokes tend to be outside in. And hitting in this direction, what it shows is that the racket faces on the ball a long time. A long time. And that's called outside in, and that arm is moving from away to me to in. If I want to pop the ball, it tends to be more inside out. And now you see a lot more racket speed from me. And one of the arts of the game is to have both strokes so that if you're borrowing pace, you can play outside in. And if you're trying to crack it, then you could start outside but work inside to hit the ball. And many times players that are very good at blocking the ball are always playing outside in. And players that are hitters play inside out. But start to look at those swings and start to develop those for yourself because this game is rich with variety and rich with ways to hit the ball and play the game. The Superfluid Swing. There's a wonderful book called Quantum Golf by Kajel Enhanger, who's a sports psychologist on the golf tour and also practitioner of transcendental, transcendental meditation. And I highly recommend the book to tennis players. And it talks about a golfer who's very good at the game and tries too hard and meets a coach that gets him to do less and less. And if you take a moment to read the words of my summary, they talk about loosening the grip. They talk about narrowing the stance. And they're talking about this in golf, but the same thing applies to tennis. And way too often, players come to the game with force and effort. We could say they're fighting the ball. But quantum golf or quantum tennis is about how to do more with less. And I still remember when Tom Stowe used to say, Jim, swing slower and hit harder. And people would be laughing. And what do you mean? And the idea was that you could find the rhythm of a swing and where the maximum racket speed was as opposed to a swing where maximum racket speed was over a huge area. And when you really watch one another play, you'll often see tension in the jaw of hitters. And you'll see sort of a slack jaw of somebody that's more relaxed. You'll also notice this at the driving range if the 12 year old girl next to you hits it farther than you. It says she doesn't have enough strength in her arm to fight the club, so then it becomes a super fluid swing. It's a wonderful book to read when you're traveling, and it changed my attitude to tennis based on how to teach it, because I'm very keen now to watch students who are working and bringing work to the court, as opposed to students that say, yeah, it's kind of fun here. Let's see what we can do with the ball the superfluid swing. Malcolm Balk, a friend of mine, wrote a great book called Mastering the Art of Running. And it's about applying the Alexander Technique, posture, open shoulders, head held high, to show how runners can run with effort or not. And all the pictures in the book are really showing runners in the Olympics compared to runners like you and I about whether or not we approach running as something that can be efficient or effortful. And he makes a very good comment that practice doesn't make perfect, it makes permanent. And so if you could be at a golf course and see that golfers will take many, many swings without a ball, I really don't believe that tennis players are doing that enough. Do they ever practice 
without a ball many, many times to monitor, and I write about this a lot, their balance and their rhythm and whether it's effortful or effortless. But if there's any stroke that you're trying to learn in the game, I actually believe you can capture a part of it by rehearsing. And even in our ball machine classes, we'll do something where Margaret could be the hitter and somebody would be behind her waiting for a turn and I ask them to rehearse and they look at me like, well, no one rehearses in tennis, but I went through all this as a player, as a student, about the idea that if you're trying to improve your performance before you ever do it with a ball, can you do that same thing without a ball? And even now, this first move, I'm keeping my back as straight as I can, I'm doing as little as I can with my hands, and all I'm doing is I'm rehearsing something called dead hands. Now that's one aspect of the game, but meaning my body's moving and the racket's following. I cannot ever encourage you enough to rehearse without a ball, whether it's your serve, your forehand, or even your volley. This is a game for a lifetime, and we can always try to get better when we recognize that practice makes permanent, but perfect practice may make perfect.